Welcome to the Freedom or Bust podcast with Joelle and Natalie Rivera. You are here because you will accept nothing less than the freedom to determine your destiny, do what you love, and fulfill your life's purpose. We believe that self-employment is the ultimate form of empowerment, and our mission is to bring you guests whose powerful entrepreneurship stories and real-world advice will give you the inspiration and tools to create a business and life that you love. In this episode, Joelle and Natalie interview hypnotherapist and life coach, Dr. Flavio Balladini. A love of learning and a fascination with how the human mind, body, and spirit work led Flavio to receive degrees in both philosophy and biomedical engineering. While studying degenerative diseases and teaching at the university in his career, Flavio simultaneously went on a profound spiritual quest in his own mind and beyond. And when he was introduced to hypnotherapy for the first time, he experienced personal transformation. And as he continued to study the field, he became intrigued by the impact that hypnosis had on the physical body. He began practicing hypnotherapy in 1996 when he opened the Hypnotherapy and Counseling Center in Miami, Florida. He offers a unique and pioneering approach, bringing together his scientific understanding of the human body and his training and experience with the deep inner workings of the subconscious and unconscious minds. Flavio helps people connect their outer with their inner selves so they can achieve their purpose and materialize their dreams. So we just want to welcome uh, Dr. Fla Flavio Ballerini, and we're so excited to have you here with us. Um, we're thankful that you're taking your time. I know you're a very busy man and I, uh, I thank you for all the contributions that you've done. Just for those of you that are listening that don't know a lot about his past, he's the founder of uh, the Hypnotherapy and Counseling Center in Miami. He also has his PhD in biomedical engineering. He's been uh, doing hypnotherapy, I think for 23 years now, is that correct? Yes, 23 this year, yes. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a long time. Actually, 23 is our golden number. <laughs> so we always say that if we see the number 23, it's a good sign. It's a good sign. Uh, and, and we're excited to be collaborating because the mm -hmm. reason why we're doing this interview is because we are collaborating on a course together where we're going to be presenting or um, Flavio is going to be presenting how to be a hypnotherapist, learning all about hypnosis and how to use it in uh, the life of your clients, as well as how to apply it if you're an existing life coach, which a lot of our students are. So we're just exciting to be collaborating together. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you uh, just for everything that you've done. I, you know, I looked at your history and everything that you've done to make a difference in people's lives, uh, not only through your center and through your practice. You know, obviously, you've even received awards for your humanitarian work and things like that. So thank you. And again, we're honored to have you here with us. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor for me as well, and I'm so happy to work with you guys. And uh, let me tell you, I'm so impressed with your background as well. You know, I also uh, have had the chance to talk to both of you, and the work you do is absolutely fantastic. So thank you, and let me tell you, the honor is all mine to work with you. Thank I you. Thank you. that. So I guess we, we'll just get started. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what hypnosis is or hypnotherapy is, just so that for those that are new to the process and have no idea what it may be? So hypnotherapy is just therapy, conventional therapy, using as its primary modality the element of hypnosis. And hypnosis is just the opportunity to get the conscious and the unconscious mind to talk to one another. So we all have a part of ourselves that we are aware of and a part of ourselves that we are unaware of. And we call that the subconscious or the unconscious. And in the course, I explain in detail this nomenclature, why we call it one thing versus another. But um, if we can get those two to talk in a more coherent way, then we can both get information from ourselves and we can also put information into ourselves. And, um, and, and that process of communicating with our unconscious minds can change our lives. In other words, we can eliminate trauma, we can eliminate problems, we can change habits, we can lose weight, we can gain weight. Believe it or not, about 20% of the people who come over to adjust their weights, they come over to actually gain weight. It's something that some people don't think about, but if you're, if you're in chemotherapy, if your person has cancer, sometimes their problem is the opposite. They cannot gain weight. You know, so we help them gain weight to be healthier. Um, and we can do that by changing the unconscious mind, which will have a direct effect upon the body. 
Well, it sounds amazing. I know that for me, I remember the first time I was exposed to it, um, going to school at UCF and uh, I was taking a course on it. And I remember uh, the instructor bringing people up and practicing hypnosis. And I was really blown away by it. I was intrigued by it. So I think that it's such a powerful tool in helping people create transformation. So what got you into it? Obviously, you have a PhD in biomedical uh, engineering, and you've done it for a long time. So what sparked you or what exposed you to it to say, you know, this is something I want to add? So I've had, uh, that's, a, that's a question that very, I get very often. You know, I have like a dual background, as many of the um, older philosophers. I started studying engineering when I was 17 out of high school. And I also wanted to study philosophy because I felt that engineering was too logical and I needed to balance that out with something more like in the humanities. So I have a degree in philosophy and a degree in engineering. Well, I always thought of philosophy as a hobby, if you will, and engineering as my profession. So first I wanted to be a professional engineer and I graduated, started working as a professional engineer. Then I was uh, given an opportunity to go back to graduate school and I wanted to uh, be a researcher. I did that for a while and then I wanted to become a professor. So I, I, I reached the opportunity to, to teach and I taught for two years at a, at a state university here. And, um, and throughout the whole process, I remained in my hobby of studying philosophy, metaphysics, uh, mysticism and hypnosis, which is a great way of getting in touch with our own unconscious, as I said earlier, which is a bridge into the higher worlds or the spiritual worlds. And that was my interest in hypnosis, more or less as a, as a tool for myself, for self and personal development. Well, my doctoral work had to do with um, cardiovascular mechanics and um, arterial disease. And as you know, it's the number one cause of death in America and many other civilized countries in the world. Heart disease is one of the biggest problems. And throughout the course of my studies at university, I came to understand that a great deal of the problem with heart disease lies in the emotion arena. You know, in other words, emotions, anger, particularly anger or resentment or that type of emotion, you know, tends to damage the physical heart. And in the medical literature at that time, back when I was at university, this was not very talked about. Nowadays it is. Nowadays we know that people can die from emotional pain. And the term that they're using in medicine nowadays is stress cardiomyopathy and that is the what we normally call a broken heart in other words you can have like a broken heart because of an emotional situation but it can translate into sudden death from heart failure and it is actually called stress cardiomyopathy in other words it's a medical diagnosis that can actually kill the person so the bridge between body and mind and spirit today is something that is commonplace people talked about uh, some 20 years ago it was less talked about but when I realized that with hypnosis, we could help people change their emotions and therefore avert some diseases and in some cases recover from diseases, I was hooked. I was fascinated. So a friend of mine one day told me that a friend of hers needed some help with hypnosis and I started doing it as a hobby as a, to help somebody. And next thing you know, it's been 22 years. Um, we, you know, a few months later, we, you know, a few months after that friend needed help, we had to open up an office because a bunch of people were asking for help. And, um, and I left university. I was teaching mechanical engineering and I left university and um, never looked back. You know, it was, uh, it was a great adventure. It, was a, it has been a great adventure. You know, so that's what happened. I, I just wanted to help people overcome Parents that can actually damage bodies. That's how I started. But then, of course, you know, it turned into a generic practice, you know, habits, weight loss, smoking, that type of thing. I love that because you, you first of all, you bring your engineering mind into it. Uh, yeah. What I love about your, your course where you're training people how to use hypnosis is that it's so logical. Everything that you're saying makes so much sense and it's, it takes you step by step by step. But I, I can totally see that your training as an engineer and a researcher comes through in the way that you teach others because it's so easy to follow and to understand. But even more, what I love is your passion for it, that the reason why you got into it was for your own personal growth, but then you really wanted to, to help people. And everything that we do, it comes from the same place. It's like where, you know, 
we're avid personal development junkies. We're always trying to learn something. Um, everything that we do also comes from the mind, body, spirit realm, where we're understanding the interplay between them and that ultimately we're doing it because we want to help. So, so when, you know, when we first met, it was like, we, we definitely related. We were on the same page. We're, we're in this for the same reason. And so um, that's why I love your story of how you got into it is because you really you made the switch because of passion, not because it was the most practical thing to leave this, you know, pretty good paying job in, you know, medical engineering as a professor. You did it because this is really something that you felt could make a difference. Yeah. yeah. And, and your passion also shows through. And that's one of the reasons you know, because uh, it shows through so clearly that you're passionate about what you do. And I think that's beautiful. You know, I think the world needs more people like you guys. You know, I'm so happy to, to have this opportunity to get to know you and to work with you. That's awesome. Well, and thank you. And, and that's what, one of the things for those of you um, that don't know a little bit of the background, we actually ended up meeting by chance, which that's the way that life a lot of times works. Uh, we were at a conference together um, with, I think, how many? 3,000 other people. And uh, we just happened to hit it off and, and really connect. And, and obviously, you have this big passion of, contributing and you're such a wealth of knowledge and that's what I really love is that you know you have a balance and we we work with a lot of people in different fields whether you know uh, actually one of the people that we work with our marketing he's an engineer he used to work with Boeing and you bring both sides because you have the philosophy side and you have the engineering mind so I think that you've done a beautiful job really finding that balance and I actually I want to rewind a little bit because one of the things that we like to explore is entrepreneurship and you are an entrepreneur, you have a, a successful business. So was this something that you ever considered like going to, like creating your own business? Was that part of your longer, bigger vision? Or was it something that just kind of unfolded as you started this hypnosis thing and said, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward with this? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. You know, I, I Thing that I question myself about, you know, I never ever built a business. I never planned on building a business. I never worked on it in any way, shape, or form. Just as you said that you met by chance, you know, I started doing the work and I allowed things to unfold. And um, I sort of surrendered into this higher purpose. I think that life somehow has a presents us with a series of coincidences, as you put it, a series of chances, as you said, you know. And we kind of uh, ride that wave. And through that wave, you know, I, we've come to, to have a school where I've uh, graduated over 3,000 uh, students of hypnotherapy in a brick and mortar school. We teach uh, seven days a week, you know, different, not me personally, I only teach two days a week, but different people teach uh, metaphysics, uh, philosophy, different kinds of classes, even astrology. Um, I mean, all kinds of things. And, um, and it's, it's just an awesome um, opportunity to serve so many people in so many different ways. I ended up going to medical school. Um, the title doctor is a title that can be used both in a medical sense and also in a uh, scientific sense. And um, when a person would come to see me, they would read up on me and see the title and ask me if I could help them with medications because a lot of the people who seek hypnotherapy also take psychotropic medication. In other words, things for depression, anxiety. And of course, I wasn't able to help them with medication for legal reasons, but also for knowledge. I had a friend, you know, who was a psychiatrist, and he would help out a little bit, you know, those patients or those clients who needed medication. But he um, kind of got tired of helping me out one day. So I said, well, let me go to medical school and let me be the psychiatrist and let me do that part as well. So I ended up in medical school. Um, psychiatry is a little bit of a difficult profession nowadays because we do mostly um, medication management. So I didn't go into residency. I don't practice medicine, but I went to medical school. And that was an awesome adventure because it gave me a whole different insight into the relationship between body and mind. And... Um, in a whole different kind of respect, you know, for medical doctors and also for the people who come to the office with medical problems, a whole different kind of understanding and also compassion. You know, there's a lot of suffering, particularly as people age, they become um, part of a system that is really difficult. So I think that understanding a little bit of what they're going through, both physically, but also institutionally, as they're dealing with hospitals and doctors, I think that that has been an invaluable experience. 
And um, so this dual background continues. I continue teaching mysticism and also we continue practicing hypnotherapy and coaching and uh, helping people with all kinds of uh, problems, you know, as, as they come. But no, there was no intention to ever build a business. So that sometimes because I figured, well, perhaps I could have done better had they planned it more carefully. On the other hand, I think the sorts of adventures that we were able to live in terms of in terms of the help that we got, I would say, in terms of the universe helping, I think that that may not have been available had I been more intellectual about it and planned a business, you know. So it just kind of unfolded as it did. And here we are. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, and actually, I love that you say allowing and surrendering. Uh, yeah. Because actually, we, we also preach that uh, with some of the, a lot of things that we do. Uh, I'll just give you a quick story of how our book publishing uh, company started is that we were sitting in our backyard on the dock and we were really visualizing what we wanted to create. And we said, you know, we wanted to be more like K house at the time. So we wanted, we were already doing conferences, bringing speakers and doing all those things and said, would it be great to have a book publishing company so we can also do that. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting in the backyard kind of visualizing the next morning, we had someone just contact us, a lawyer, who said, I have a book publishing company and I want to gift it to you. Uh, I love what you're doing with the magazine. I want to give you the rights to all my books and I'll do all the legal paperwork and do all those things. So uh, I think that life can be very magical at times yeah. if you allow it to be uh, and are open to that. So, yeah. and, and again, I think that Anthony Robbins, I love one of the things that he always says is that life is happening for you and not to you. And I love the fact that you seem to have embraced that. And one of the questions that people listening yeah. might ask is, yeah. how do you do it? You know, how have you managed your time in a way that's allowed you to pursue so much knowledge and education, really manage a business at the same time, and do all the things that you've done to contribute? And uh, because most people will look at that and say, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how to do one thing. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. You know, I, one of the big elements in my life has been meditation, you know, in the mystical sense. And um, I think that when a person meditates, not with the intention of visualizing physical goals only, but with the intention of connecting with a higher purpose. I, you know, the way that I've used meditation, it has not been to achieve, you know, goals in life. I haven't used it that way. Um, I learned from a very um, traditional source and, um, you know, and, and there's this lengthy old tradition that, you know, we use meditation to connect with the higher source. And that's how I learned and that's, that's how I've always practiced. And when I connect with the higher source, well, you know, what I call a higher source, there is a natural sense of um, what else can I do? What else can I do? In other words, what, how else can I contribute? And I remember since the very early days, you know, um, having the opportunity to be a guest on a radio program or a TV program, you know, I would simply connect to the higher source. And oftentimes by the time I got off my, my little room where I meditated, there were a message or something, can you come to the program tomorrow, that kind of thing. And, you know, we never really advertised for clients. And for 22 years, we've made a living without really any marketing program of any type. People just find me and call me. And uh, students find our school. We don't have any marketing whatsoever. And um, classes are always relatively full. And uh, the office is always booked, you know, and uh, without any marketing, which is absolutely fascinating. The only marketing that we have is the, is the uh, desire to serve and contribute. And people end up finding us. Even in this busy and crowded world, you know, it still happens that way to this very date. So to me, that's a testimony of the power of connecting to the higher source. And that's how I got into hypnosis as a, as a, as a tool to connect with the higher source. So my passion for teaching and sharing, I, I don't really call myself a teacher. I say that I share with others what I have learned. And I think that the passion to share comes from the awareness that everybody can have the same thing. Everybody can have the same access to their own higher selves. And also it's just a matter of learning a few techniques. And, you know, we, we also have the opportunity of helping others. So if you learn these techniques, the hypnotherapy techniques, you can help many people. And by the way, the people who take our classes are not only people who want to be a professional hypnotherapist. Many people are in other professions, but they learn the same techniques that we use in the office for therapy purpose. For instance, dentists, 
doctors because what you learn is how to communicate with others in a way that get them to take the right sorts of actions. You know, so the art of suggestion, for instance, the art of building rapport, things that you can learn in other fields as well. But in this course, you know, we, we cover some of those topics and other professionals appreciate that as well. Well, and actually what's really interesting about what you're saying is that um, I love that you said ultimately that the reason why you are able to accomplish so many different things in your life is because of meditation. And really the, the underlying purpose of that is that it gives you clarity. It gives you access to, you know, a higher level of energy, a higher version of yourself, a higher power, and that you're not just taking responsibility and saying, yeah, I did it because I, I, I pushed through and I worked really hard. You're saying you did it because you got yourself in a state of alignment and then followed what you were you know, feeling drawn to do. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to point out. And also I think it's, it's a good time to point out that hypnotherapy is often used to help people learn how to do meditation or you know you could call it self-hypnosis you can call it meditation but that that it's a similar process and getting into that state is also the same process and so it's such a powerful tool like you said for so many different types of practitioners but if for anyone who's ever interested in meditation that hypnotherapy or hypnosis is a powerful tool to learn how to not only get into that state but also you know, ways that you can use that state, because ultimately we're talking about accessing the unconscious or subconscious mind, regardless of what, what words you want to use to describe how you're getting there or what you're actually doing while you're there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I, one of the questions that I, I do have is that a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, but I've heard people say is that they, they hear the word hypnosis or hypnotherapy and, you know, they, they want to incorporate it into some of the things like you're saying, it's an essential skill. If you work with people, there's so much you can learn from it. Even if you don't practice it, like uh, as this is what I'm going to do full time. Uh, like you mentioned dentists and things like that. But for some people it can sound scary because they don't understand what it is when you're talking about working with the subconscious mind or, or all these different things. Can you explain uh, or, or share some of your thoughts on how you would use it and just the impact that it can have on people uh, to demystify it, I guess. Yeah, this is one of the most common questions that we ask when it comes to the word hypnosis, you know, because like everything else in the world, everything can be used for many different kinds of purposes, right? You can, you, you can think of hypnosis as a way of people's minds and emotions, of course. But that's what I would call a negative use of the concept, a negative use of the tool, and I compare that to the use of a knife in the, hand of, um, in the hands of a criminal, a knife can kill. But the very same knife in the hand of a skilled surgeon can save a life. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making is, you know, if, if a person has a knife and they say, okay, I'm going to use this knife on you, the first question I would ask is, okay, are you a surgeon about to operate on me to save my life or is this a criminal who wants to hurt me? The knife itself is just a tool that needs to be used to gain access to a particular organ, right? So hypnosis is just a tool that we use to gain access to a part of the mind. The, the question here isn't whether hypnosis, you know, how, you know, it, it's who is using it and for what purposes. I think, and, and the tradition from which I learned, you know, any negative use, you know, we call this manipulation, we call this hacking, you know, any sort of use of that type is just, um, is just uh, very unfortunate, you know. And um, we, we study this concept of the law of karma and we teach our students, you know, anything that we do to harm another person or because the, the concept of harm is very relative, but anytime that we use something in a way that only benefits us, we're harming another person by definition. But if you're using hypnosis to benefit the other person, according to the other person's definition of benefit, right, then you're not harming them. So that's why in a clinical setting, a person comes over, they define their problem, and they define their objective. You simply help them achieve it using hypnosis. But the word hypnosis itself um, has been the subject of confusion, has been the subject of uh, controversial comments, you know, and... Uh, uh, and you know, a lot of salespeople might 
use hypnosis to convince a person to buy a product or something like this. And, you know, some people dislike that. You know, for instance, there's a common idea in sales, which is buyer's remorse. People say that a person will buy something, but the next day they don't feel good about the purchase. And I actually believe that buyer's remorse happens when the person felt conned into buying. In other words, the salesperson may have used a few hypnotic techniques to get them to buy. But the buyer left perhaps enthusiastic that day, but the next day they had remorse. And I think that, you know, that's a reflection of them potentially having felt manipulated into buying. When that happens, what are we building? Are we likely to go back to the store or to the salesperson to buy again in the future? In other words, if a person uses hypnosis that way, I don't think they're building long-term relationships. You know, so I, I think it's important to, to build a, a long-term track record. You know, for instance, we've been at this very same office in school and our school has been there for 30 years in our office for 22 years. And um, I'm in the same place. People know me. People have seen me. They've seen me on the radio, on the TV. They've seen me. They, they go there. They call me. It's the same phone number. You know, there's, there's nothing hidden. And I think that by now, if we were to use hypnosis in a way that is detrimental to somebody, somebody would have already found out. It's not what we do. So, so there, is a, there is a sense in which hypnosis can be misused. And there is a sense in which it has been misused. But, you know, and that's a little bit unfortunate. What we do is we emphasize the clinical, the, the, the practical, the healing side of hypnosis, always focused on the person. What is it that you want to achieve and how can we empower you to achieve your own goals? And if we stick to that particular principle, we're safe. We're not trumping on anybody's uh, will or anything like that. You know, we're just empowering people to achieve their objectives and it works really, really well. Well, and I love so, that. I love that your perspective of it is that just because someone else might misuse the tool or the concept doesn't mean that for anyone like us, like you, or anyone who's interested in learning it or using it, that, that there's anything innately bad about it. Um, it's actually quite wonderful. It's, it's in, in a, an empowerment to, tool because especially with us, uh, we work with a lot of life coaches that their job is to help people determine what they want set a goal, reach towards that goal, and overcome the hurdles. And many of those hurdles are emotional or psychological. They're limiting belief systems. And sometimes people who have great intentions and a lot of talent and a lot of potential get stuck because there's something holding them back internally. And that's where hypnosis has been proven to be such an effective way of getting into the root of the problem rather than just simply focusing on the surface level. And I know that um, in your course, you teach about, you know, you mentioned that there's a difference between something like cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnotherapy because cognitive behavioral therapy is cognitive. It's focused on your conscious thoughts, whereas hypnotherapy allows you to get to a deeper level. And so um, if you wanted to share a little bit about like like, how does it work in the unconscious mind? And then also, have you had any, you know, really profound experiences that you could share where you've had results that your clients have received so that people can get a sense for really, like, how is it that accessing the unconscious or subconscious mind can make a difference in their lives? Yeah, sure. I, I, you know, there are many, many examples. Look, watch. I think that there's a, I think that with cognitive therapies and there are many types of psychotherapies at the cognitive level in some movement, obviously. You know, and to students sometimes I compare this to the opportunity of improving on a car. You can take a Chevrolet and you can paint it a different color and maybe you can change the rims and you can change the seats and you might make it a better Chevrolet, but you're not going to turn it into a, a jet airliner. You know, it's still going to be a Chevrolet, perhaps a little bit improved, perhaps a little bit nicer. And uh, we can change a person's experience in this life by giving them tools to think differently. And, and in fact, this has been very successful in dealing with anxiety, with panic, with depression. You know, we help them change their thoughts and we help them change, interrupt their thoughts and different techniques in CBT, as you mentioned, you know, people have achieved some success, but there's no transformation there. They didn't become someone else as in the sense that I'm about to tell you. You take a man, for instance, who came to see me once and he was overweight, depressed, unhappy all around with his life. He had two children 
and uh, he was married, long-term marriage, you know, but very, very happy in his life, and didn't know what was wrong with him. And, you know, you take a situation like this, and you can talk about this problem that this man apparently is having for years and not get any result. And um, he only came to see me two or three times, and I remember one time he came to see me, he goes into this very, very deep state of hypnosis, and he finds what he calls a light that is, and, and this is how he describes it. The light is bigger than him, and yet it's within him. And he's having this profound mystical experience, right? And um, the session is over. He leaves. This was a Friday night. And I found out what happened when he comes back a few days later. And he tells me, look, when I left the office, you know, I was very empowered by that experience, right? So I went home. I couldn't quite sleep. I was reading all night. I was, you know, talking to my wife, you know, things that he had never done before. The next morning, he gets up very, very early. And it occurs to him for the first time in his life to prepare breakfast for the family. You see, he never thought of that type of thing before. It was not his duty. It was not his job to do. But that day, he got up really early, went to the store, went to the grocery store to get the groceries to prepare breakfast. And it was so early that the grocery store was closed. So he waits for a few minutes in his car. When he sees people walking into the store, he gets off the car. And when he gets off the car, he tells me with tears running down his cheeks, he tells me, I saw the sun for the first time. And clearly, I don't think he meant, you know, the physical son. I think he already knew that the son existed by the time he was 52 years of age. But he told me with tears in his eyes, I saw the son for the first time. You know, as he's getting off the car, he sees the sun and that transforms his life. You know, the night, you know, a few nights, you know, the night before at the office, he had seen this light which was bigger than him and, you know, transformed him somehow. So these types of experiences have been described in the literature under various names, including illumination. And I don't think you can produce that kind of experience with, you know, with, with cognitive techniques alone, telling people how to think or what to do, you know, do it this way instead of that way. I don't think we can get there. So this, this is a class of experience that I call transformative. In other words, we we change forms altogether as opposed to increment a little bit and improve a little bit on the way we were before. There was this lady who comes to see me once to give you another example. And she was an attractive lady. Um, she had been divorced. She told me for 14 years or 10 years, you know, I, I sometimes change a few details around a little bit to not identify anybody, but she had been divorced for many years and she was well off. She was very well dressed, very well educated and a very sophisticated lady. And she worked at a place where she was in public evidence. In other words, she wasn't uh, hidden away at some office somewhere where nobody saw her. And the point I'm making here is that she had ample opportunity to meet a man. And yet she told me that in 14 years, nobody would even ask her out for a cup of coffee. She, was, she felt invisible. And so we worked for a few weeks. And there was a session, which was on a Saturday afternoon, in which she finds the source of her invisibility. Well, I remember her really well, because I remember the car she drove, you know, the office where I work at. There's a large window in the front, which, from which you can see the parking lot. And I see people coming in and parking and coming into the office. I see them, you know, I greet them outside, so I know what kind of car they drive. I just kind of developed a habit. And... Um, she happened to drive a late model car. This was many years ago. And as she goes off to her car, it was a Saturday afternoon, she stops at a gas station close to the office and the man pumping gas next to her, on the pump next to her, starts asking her about her car. And to make a long story short, they became a couple. Now, this is interesting because for 14 years, she felt invisible. Invisible. She says, not even a cup of coffee, not one invitation. And precisely... A few moments after she has this transformative hypnotic experience within herself, she says that she goes to the gas station, a very routine operation to pump gas into the car. And this man starts asking her, you know, uh, you know, asking her about the car, but clearly with the intention of meeting her. And they eventually traded emails and phone numbers and stuff. And they started talking and became a couple as far as, far as I saw her. They were still dating. They were going out and they're very happy together. So I don't think, I'm not sure that I could have coached her 
we can't say, okay, just go to the gas station and when you go to the gas station, look around, there might be a man there pumping gas, maybe that man will become your boyfriend. I don't think that we can do this with cognitive techniques. You, for instance, gave an example earlier where you went to a seminar and you by chance met and you hit it off, you know? So that kind of magic, I think, happens when there's something in the unconscious that is ready, that is vibrating at the right vibration where people somehow click and connect. And that's what happened to her. And I'm not sure that we could have produced that kind of changing vibration simply by telling her what to do. Perhaps we could have done it, but I think it would have taken much longer. So what's beautiful about hypnosis, I think, is that you know, with a little bit of training, a little bit of skill, we can help people achieve profound transformation in their lives in a relatively short period of time. Well, and actually what's so fascinating about those stories is that really what they show is that what hypnosis does is it gets you ultimately what I would call past the gatekeeper. That what you're pointing out is that there's a lot that we can do by changing our, our conscious cognitive thought. There's a lot we can do to change our behavior, but we're still dealing with a problem at the level of thinking that causes the problem and that we are our conscious minds, our egos, whatever you want to call it, that they kind of stuff us inside of a box and there's a lot of limitation there and there's a lot of um, defense mechanisms to protect us from what we feel is the thing that's deep down within. So by, by getting into a hypnotic state, which is ultimately just a state of really deep relaxation where we you know, get that cognitive thought out of the way, then we can access what's really going on. Um, and so I love the story, especially of the, the, the woman, cause you're pointing out, it's like, had you tried to coach her, cause you're also a life coach, then there's some practical things she could have done. She could have affirmed things. She could have even recognized through talking that there's certain beliefs she held that were holding her back. But, and that would have, been effective, but you basically just opened up the door for her to go in there and go, oh, okay, this is what's going on. So it's like, it's like a shortcut. Yeah. Yeah. I think of it as a, as a profound shortcut. Yes. Well, and I, I find it interesting because I was reading a study that showed that 50% of our daily behavior are unconscious behaviors that we don't yeah. recognize that we keep repeating. It's almost like we keep uh, rewinding and every day we wake up and we do similar things. And those behaviors, those thought processes, and the way that we react to things, they're all impacting so many aspects of our lives, but we're not even aware of them a lot of times. So I think that hypnosis is very powerful also to help us get to the root of those things, change things around, so we can create a new paradigm of our identity of who we want to be and what we want to create. I also find it powerful that you said the person's definition of benefit. Because I think it's so important to remember that it's not what you think would be beneficial for someone else, is that we have to recognize that it's what's beneficial for them, what they believe would be beneficial for them, and allow that space for it to happen. And I do want to rewind a little bit um, when we were talking about the business side, because obviously we have a lot of uh, people, whether it's through our podcasts or through our courses, that are entrepreneurs and they're really trying to figure out how to make their business grow. And it, and one of the things that we found is that contribution is so essential and that if you focus on contribution, it's almost like you bless the community, the community blesses you back. And I think that you're a good example of that because everything that you've done, you focus on how can I give, how can I contribute, how can I make a difference, how can I take this client to the next level and whether it's your, your center or whatever it is that you've done in your life, all the other things that you've done is that it's open up doors and opportunity that you didn't know were there. And that just happened naturally because you were open to that. And because you were focusing on how can I bless those around me? Yeah. Yeah. To me, that's the key to the whole thing. You know, one of the, because I think what we do is sacred, you know, I never wanted to refuse services to a person who couldn't afford it, especially the area of town where I work, where the office is, there are some low income people that come over and sometimes they walk in and they ask for help, whatever. You know. And I just started off that way and I never changed the policy. We have this idea that we, uh, we work with you regardless of your ability to pay. And, uh, but I never advertised that. I don't want that to be too advertised because of course, <laughs> we as well, you know, but, but it has been the case for all 22 years. We never refused anybody because of the inability to pay. And somebody got a hold of that piece of information and in the year 2000 awarded us the humanitarian award, which is 
from our point of view, you know, one of the most prestigious awards they could um, bestow upon somebody because I think that's what the profession is all about, you know, the human part of it, the human element. So the humanitarian award um, was really, really interesting. I didn't do it for that reason, and we haven't changed the policy in all these years, but I think that the concept of contribution has been... Uh, has been very important and a central part of what we do. The school uh, where we teach, for instance, we are all volunteers. Every teacher there is a volunteer. I don't make a living of, of, of sharing, of teaching. I make a living by helping people at the office. But I teach uh, four classes a week, every week, um, sometimes five, depending on the week. And, um, you know, and, and there's a great deal of benefit that comes from that. You know, those are lengthy classes. Sometimes I don't leave the, the, the school until one o'clock in the morning, a couple of times a week. And uh, sometimes it can be a bit of a strain on my personal life, you know, it's, but, you know the family and so forth. But, but um, I made a decision a long time ago, you know, as to what's important. And, um, and I think that that level of contribution is important. And, um, and so I made the decision to stick with it year after year after year after year. And it isn't a sacrifice. It becomes a part of who one is, you know. And I think later as a hypnotist, you begin to realize that most likely we've been doing this for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, you know, it's, it's just part of, our, part of who we are and part of what we came here to do. And also, I think another side of this coin that I think is important to address is that we're, all, we're also students. I'm also a student both of myself and a student of life itself, you know. I don't get it all right by any stretch of the imagination. I have all kinds of personal areas that I need to grow and develop, you know. But I use also some of the tools that, you know, I, I, I use health hypnosis and I also have work with other people into hypnosis at a deeper level to overcome some, um, some important uh, crisis, you know, when they happen and, and also to prevent them from happening and sometimes ahead of time. But, um, and I think that the people who come over to the office see that and feel that we don't think we know it all and we don't uh, promote the idea that we have all the answers or anything like this. In fact, we stay away from having answers. We believe that each person has the answers that are better for them inside of them. My job isn't to give you answers. My job is to help you get to your own answer. You know, so we don't, we're, we, you know, we're not a guru. We don't have answers. We don't have, a, that's not at all what we do. We help people come up with their own answers, and that works really, really well. When I love that you you say that you're a student, and that you also, because for us, for example, I feel like every time I do a workshop, a conference, I'm working with a client one on one. I feel like I'm getting the same thing that I'm giving. Like I'm yeah. learning so much from every interaction, um, and I think that's one of the biggest blessing. I think that you feel the same way and that what you do, you're contributing, but at the same time, you're so open to learning from every experience. And I think that's what makes you so effective in what you do uh, for the most part. And also at the same time, it's like we can see in you the same thing that um, drives us. Whereas like it might be that we're drawn to a certain topic or we're exploring something because we're, we're using it for ourselves. We're learning as a person. We're, we're trying to grow. We're expanding our mind. We're trying to heal. We're becoming a better person. But then because we love it so much and we see the results, then we want to turn around and share it with everybody else too. And so uh, we can definitely see that in you. This, you know, it started this journey inside of yourself. It's like, wow, this is pretty amazing. So now I want to, you know, help other people have this experience. Um, and so we just, we just love that. And, and we love talking about things like this because I think that hypnotherapy or hypnosis, whether you want to explore it for yourself personally, or you want to learn how to do it with other people to help them, that it's so powerful. And it's something that's so often overlooked as a possibility. Whereas, um, something like meditating is becoming mainstream and, um, actually, hypnosis is becoming more mainstream than ever has been before, but I'd love to be able to see it start to become accepted across the board as something normal because everybody could literally benefit from using a tool like this. And I just love that you're, you're so authentic and your passion comes through that it makes it something that you know might open people's mind and say, you know, this is really something that could help me personally. Look at what it's done for these other people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do want to ask you uh, one quick question is 
what are something, is there something that you're working on that you just want to share that you're excited about? Uh, Cause obviously those people that are listening also want to know more about what you're working on currently, maybe that might be able to help them or, or something. I know you've mentioned some of the books that you have uh, enormous amounts of books within you. that are almost ready to be out there, but what are other projects or other things that you're working on that you're excited about? Well, I think you, I think you hit them all. You know, one of the things that I'm working on is the um, it, over the years I've been writing all of these books, but for whatever reason, again, you know, I work based on this intuition thing as opposed to a business model, and uh, for whatever reason, they were kept in a, in a file somewhere, you know, in a computer file somewhere, and there are quite a few of them, interesting ones. Some of them, I guess, you know, and then meeting you, you know, you happen to have a booking a book publishing company maybe we can uh, get those books out there you know and uh, I'm doing some final edits and everything else so that's one part of the project I think getting the information out in a way that may benefit some other people people who like to read as opposed to the other thing is that by a series of coincidences as you described earlier somebody just offered me a radio program which is um, you know I, I've, of, I've often been invited on radio and TV you know as a guest but I never really thought of um, doing my own program years ago. I had a program for about a year, but I would pay the hour, you know, so I could go on the radio and speak up my mind, whatever, you know. But that was back in the 90s and uh, it didn't really go anywhere. And um, somebody comes over to the office one day, not too long ago, in the middle of a very, you know, dark night of the soul, if you will, you know, in the middle of this desperation, a lady comes up and says, you know, I've been, you don't know me, but I've been following you for about a year and a half. And I said, really? says, yeah, I've been following you. I come to your classes. The classes sometimes are really large, and I don't know everybody who's there. I've been coming to your classes. I've been on the radio periodically now. And I think more people need to hear you. And I said, well, I, what do you mean? And, and anyway, makes her short. She has all the connections with the radio stations and all the radio managers and everything else. And so she actually um, got us a radio program. Uh, in the Spanish community here, which is really, really exciting, particularly because it came from nowhere, quote unquote, you know, it came from whatever. And uh, it sort of landed on my lap that way. And um, I take those kinds of things, just as you describe your marriage, you know, I take those kinds of uh, things as a sign that this is right. In other words, I didn't go out seeking it. It just came to me totally unrequested. And to be frank with you, it came to me at a time in my life when I didn't think I could do it. You know, I was going through a personal crisis, you know, but, but this lady came over like an angel and said, you know what, I've been following you, and I think, uh, I think we're going to do well with this. You know, she believed in the possibility. So uh, she signed everything up, you know, and, and, and got everything ready to go, and we're starting uh, next week. And uh, in the Spanish uh, station, is going to be, it's called um, Salud Cuerpo y Mente. Uh, salud, uh, perdón, perdón, Salud Mente y alma, sorry, because we've been discussing different names. Salud, mente y alma. That's the final name that we came up with. Salud, mente y alma. And so it's a one-hour program, and we're going to divide it into three things. We're going to talk about physical health, mental, and spiritual issues in one program. And uh, the program director and the radio people are really excited about it. They said that there's a big need for this program, and also we'll see. We'll see what happens. And um, I'm just excited to be a part of it. You know, I don't think it's my program. I think I'm just uh, one more piece in the puzzle, one more part in it. You know, but they're excited about it. They think uh, it has a great deal of uh, potential for success. So we'll see. I'll, I'll watch, you know, and see what happens. You know? Well, I love that. I love that you're open. You know, yeah. you're open to going with the flow and, and, and taking the opportunity and just seeing where it goes. Um, and I also love the fact that you mentioned something I think is critical for a lot of people listening to know and to understand is that sometimes they put people in pedestals and they forget that it's all a human experience. For example, yeah. for me, when I was bedridden for a year and sick, you know, there were many times that were challenging in my life and, and all of us, whether we're uh, helpers, whether other people that, you know, come to us and we work with or whether themselves, no matter, you're going to face challenges in life. You know, and I think that adding these tools, and for example, for me, adding uh, tools in psychology and learning how to meditate and learning all these different things, whether it's mind, uh, body, or spiritual tools that I've learned, have helped me through that process. And that's what I love, that you're such a, you're a teacher. You know, you help people add these tools to their lives. 
so they can deal with when challenges come in their lives. So they can help take those challenges and do something with them that are going to help them leapfrog them in wherever it is that they want to go. Because again, life is happening for us. So what can I do with this crisis? What can I do with this challenge in my life so I can improve myself? So then I can help other people possibly that are going through the same challenges. Because I think that as we learn from each obstacle, we become teachers of that obstacles for other people to learn as well. And actually, um, one of the things that it makes me think of what Joel's just saying is that, like, none of us are perfect. No. We're all in a state of continuing to evolve. And part of that evolution is personal, but part of it goes out into the world. And especially people in helping fields like us, we're trying to make a difference in the world. And therefore, we have a responsibility to continue to grow and change and develop as ourselves. Um, but there's also sometimes a broader goal. And so that brings me to the last question. And so it's actually a two-part question. One is that what, are, what would you say is the difference that you want to make in your own life or as far as do you have any, any goal or dream that you're looking towards in the future? And the second part of the question is what's the biggest difference that you want to make in the world or in the lives of the people that you serve. So, so for yourself, what are you in this for? And then at a bigger picture, what's the legacy that you're wanting to leave behind? Yeah. Thank you. That's so I follow a very um, ancient philosophical tradition, a mystical tradition in which we say and we teach that people you know, we are many things at once. You know, we are both a soul, a spiritual, and a physical entity. And what happens to the physical entity, the person that lives here on the earth, is that we kind of forget about who we really are. And we develop what we call the ego. We develop another, another um, type of life here on the earth. And sometimes we forget what's really important to us until it's too late. So in this tradition, what we help people accomplish is a reconnection with who they really are. I think we all have this seed of a feeling inside, you know, that, 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 that there's something else to life, something else that I'm missing. And that something else is ourselves, our souls, our, our hearts, you know, something else in there. So I think that to me, what's important is that reconnection, you know, to help a person connect with who they are, because when they connect, everything else aligns naturally. I th one of the reasons why people resist the reconnection is because invariably when we reconnect, we lose something. Whatever doesn't belong goes away. When you reconnect, you sort of bring order into your life and whatever isn't a part of your true life sort of falls off. And sometimes we're too attached to different elements of our lives and we don't want to let go of those elements. And so it can be very difficult. And so we resist and resist and resist and God knows that and myself, you know, they realize, okay, it's time to surrender and allow the connection to take place and allow whatever needs to go to go so that we can manifest a higher purpose. And when you do manifest a higher purpose, you understand a much, much, much bigger picture as to what life is. I, I don't think that's the biggest picture because I think there's always a bigger picture, but you see a much bigger picture. There's a purpose. There's, you know, the universe is friendly and everything is happening, like you said, for you in a very profound way, you know. So that feeling becomes a constant source of elation, which allows us to not only live a better life, but contribute to a better life for others. So you're asking me what would I, what sort of legacy I would like to um, to number one, help more people achieve the very same feeling, but number two, perhaps document some of these ideas in a way that other people don't have to waste as much time learning it. In other words, if we can be more effective in helping people how to bypass the learning process. In other words, do it shorter when they're younger. One of the things that we take a great deal of pride in our school is that we have a division where we teach kids these things, meditation and good thoughts for children. And we think it's wonderful, you know, so they don't have to suffer as much as we, we adults did, you know. So we want to teach them early on how to look into, how to look at life this way. So we like to, to come up with better ways of helping people achieve what they're beginning to discover, but at an earlier age, so they don't have to suffer so much, you know, through the adult years. And, um, and I think part of that is the online courses, part of that is the books, part of that is the, the new techniques that we're continuously improving upon, 
but I'm confident that you know the next generation will be much better than ours, or at least my generation, because I think that they're not going to waste as much time suffering as much as we did. Mm-hmm. You know, I think these techniques will continue to improve. You know, with the work that you guys do and so many other people are doing now, I think that the next generation is going to be much better. And there will be peace in the world. Thank God, you know. I mean, we're going to live in a peaceful world eventually. Yeah. Well, so, and I love it. Uh, I love all of it. And I think that we're so in alignment with all those things. That's why for us, we focus on democratization of education. Yeah. And how can we give access to that? Because I think that it all starts with education and information. Uh, and I love that you want to make a, that impact and make that impact at a younger stage too. Yeah. Because the, the younger that you get these tools, the more that you'll be able to live a life without all that suffering and all that chaos and really live your purpose. You know, have that opportunity to really be aligned with your higher purpose and what you're trying to achieve and make that difference in the world. Because I really do feel like everyone is meant to make a difference in the world. Yeah. It's just, it's a different purpose and it's a different reason, but it's helping people connect to that. So that they can live a full life. And it doesn't have to be like this difference where they make an uh, impact in millions of people or, or tens of thousands of people's lives. It could be that impact to like one to five people. But those one to five people continue to plant those seeds of transformation to those around them. So, uh, And I'm ab- I absolutely yeah. agree with you that that world peace is actually possible. But I think what a lot of people miss is that it comes from inside of each individual person. Right. And that by changing the paradigm of life and the way that people are taught how to think about themselves and each other and the world and our mind and our capabilities, that's where the transformation happens. If we can change the way that people experience their life themselves internally from the inside out, then there's less people committing crimes. There's less people being harmful. There's less people who are attached to their their ego desires and their opinions and they're more open-minded and, and that that we're already moving that direction. And actually, people like you have been pioneers, mm-hmm. that you you dove into the metaphysical world and to hypnosis at a time when it, when it wasn't cool and you mm-hmm. probably got a lot of flack for it. And coming from a science background, a lot of people probably thought you were crazy, but you were willing to do it because you had the experience mm-hmm. yourself. And here you are 20 some odd years later, still pioneering it, still pushing it to the next level, trying to find a better way to approach the topic, better ways of explaining, helping people understand it, spreading it. So it's so important And so I just want to acknowledge you for being a pioneer in the field and not just being an expert or just running a business, that you're doing it for a higher purpose. And it has certainly uh, come through loud and clear that that's really what's going on here. So thank you for that. Well, and thank you for, like Natalie's saying, for laying the groundwork for so many other people who have made the difference because it it really is, you've been helping change the perception of what this field is. And by doing that through radio shows, through your uh, academy, through the exposure that you put yourself through, through TV and things like that, what you've done is that you've helped shift people's minds and you've helped expand it so that other people can then follow their purpose and passion and make that contribution that otherwise may not have been there for them to be able to do. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And the same to you guys. My gosh, I'm so honored to work with you guys and to talk to you guys and also so eager to learn more from both of you you know this is beautiful thank you so much thank you and uh, so dr uh, flavio ballerini if people wanted to contact you if they wanted to learn more about you if they wanted to follow you how would they be able to do that well if you look up my name you know it comes up on google you know but also if you call the office 305-267-8277 I answer the phone, not, not immediately, but I'll call you back, and I call everybody back. And, uh, and uh, sometimes it takes a few days, but I call everybody back, and I, I, I take a great deal of uh, care and talk. So if you have a question, if you want to talk, call the office. I'll be more than happy to talk to you, and, uh, and we'll, we'll go at it. Yeah. And, and one of the things that we'll do is that we'll actually put the link to your website, too. Uh, yeah. So that people listening, they, if they want to connect to your website or something like that, also your social media, we can put a link to your social media. FlavioLife.com. You know, if you go to FlavioLife.com, um, there's a website there with a whole lot of information on coaching, on a bunch of different things. Um, you can do that as well. 
Okay. okay. That sounds good. We'll put it in the show notes. And again, thank you for taking the time to meet with us, to share, to tell your stories, and also to, you know, put a good word out there into the universe about yeah. hypnotherapy and how powerful it can be in people's lives. Yeah. And we look forward to, obviously, we'll be launching a course soon uh, together, uh, relaunching one of your courses. And we look forward to, to having our students and those people who follow us too to get to know you at a deeper level and, and really be able to uh, take the transformation that you have to give because it's so thorough, but also be able to utilize some of those tools to transform people's lives as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to help us grow, please rate and share this podcast. You can also become a member of Freedom Nation. Visit freedomorbustpodcast.com and sign up to receive access to exclusive content and take the 21-day happiness challenge. As you know, we believe that entrepreneurship is the ultimate form of empowerment, which is why we created the Side Hustle Business Startup Course for anyone looking to create their own income and take back their power. We offer an exclusive discount for our podcast listeners. Find out more at freedomorbustpodcast.com.